The most successful creative people I know in my life are not successful because they're the most creative, but they're successful because they're the most consistent. On today's episode of Behind the Space Bar, sit down and talk with fellow Ableton Life certified trainer, Brian Funk, and we hear all about the importance of showing up and how to maintain creativity while you have a day job. <laughs> Hey everybody, and welcome back to Behind the Space Bar. This is a podcast for uh, folks that perform on stage with Ableton Live or hope to perform on stage with Ableton Live. Gosh, today's interview is, is a real, real gift. Um, Brian Funk is someone, if you're not familiar with Brian, he introduces himself in the podcast, but I'll spoil it. Uh, he uh, does the music production podcast, with, uh, which has uh, over, I think he said 30,000 uh, downloads a month, over a million listens in total. Um, a very, very highly rated music podcast where he sits down and interviews music producers. He also has the Music Production Club, uh, which is a, a monthly subscription um, where he uh, offers up a community. He offers up sample packs or Ableton Live. Does some really, really cool stuff uh, that I'll link to in the show notes of this. But Brian is he's also an Ableton Live certified trainer, and he's someone that I've known about for a very long time. Uh, we've, we've passed emails back and forth and traded messages on social media uh, for a few years now, and he's someone that I've wanted to connect with. And we actually talk about this in the podcast that having a podcast is a great excuse to connect with people that you've wanted to connect with for a long time, or to get to know people that you wanted to get to know. And Brian really is someone I've wanted to get to know because a trait that Brian um, exhibits that I want to be someone who exhibits is he consistently shows up. And that's one of the reasons I reached out to Brian and said, hey, I'd love to have you on Behind the Space Bar. Uh, and it's quite ironic that that's one of the biggest themes of this entire show uh, and in this entire episode. So you'll hear my conversation with Brian. Uh, we talk about the importance of showing up. We talk about the importance of being consistent in whatever you're doing. Um, we talk about how to deal with failure, how to deal with criticism. If you're someone who's creating and creating in public, uh, whether you're a musician or not, gosh, this, this episode is, is such a gem. Uh, and you're really, really going to enjoy it. Plus, one of the things I really loved is Brian talked about uh, being creative and being a successful musician, being a having a success, successful business, being a successful entrepreneur while having a day job. And he talks about why he has no plans of quitting his day job anytime soon and why he protects just music in general for him. It is, gosh, such a great conversation. You're really going to enjoy it. So without any further ado, let's get to my conversation with Brian Funk. Brian, man, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Will. Great um, to be here. Yeah, we've we've been chatting. Uh, we we should have just started recording when we hopped on because we've had some good chats so far. Yeah. getting ready for the podcast. But um, I I always ask the same question when I start podcasts. But for you, I, I have a pre question to that question. So if, if you've been listening to the podcast interviews, maybe you can cheat. You know the question I'm going to ask, but I'm going to beat you to it by asking the question, how many times in, if, in your life have people misspelled your name brain instead of Brian? <laughs> uh, you know what? That's a funny joke I have with my wife. She loves when that happens. Okay. And sometimes even refers to me as brain. As brain. As a nice. joke. And whenever I get an email, which is probably in a usual week, once or twice, sometimes okay. more, sometimes less, I always forward it to her, take a little picture of it, you nice. know, just for her own amusement. But yes, all the time. <laughs> That's great. Well, I, I I brought that up because I'm pretty sure when I went to reply to you, I mistyped it and then went, well, no, 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 no. I got to think about this. So um, <laughs> now that the pre-question to the real pre-question is out. So I always start these interviews the same way, asking people if you had to think of your unfair advantage, something that you feel like you do better than anyone else or something that you see other people struggle with that comes naturally to you. What would you say is your superpower? Oh man. Um, you focus so much on like your weaknesses, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think it, it, it's just been showing up mm, probably yeah. more than anything. I, I'm kind of a believer that the more you do something, the better you get at it. If you just mm. keep at it, for me, even music itself was a totally unknown territory for me when I started with guitar. I didn't know anything. I didn't know notes. I didn't know singers were singing notes. Mm -hmm. I just thought they were singing, making their voice sound a certain way. So I had no idea about any of that. And mm -hmm. learning music was really good for me for teaching me that lesson that you can learn something 
that you don't already know. Because I think growing up, I was like okay enough at sports and athletics, like relatively coordinated. So it wasn't something I had to work super hard at yeah. in order to like compete with everybody on a reasonable level. And in school, I did well enough without really having to try too hard. Mm. You know, got my like B pluses just by showing up. So I didn't have to, I didn't get to learn that through mm. anything until really music came along and I realized like I didn't know anything. I was 14. So, you know, you already had friends that were very musical and talented and it seemed like the kind of thing to me that you either had or you didn't. And I just mm. assumed I didn't. So I think that's the thing that I do well is I just keep showing up. How, um, <laughs> I, I want to spend a little bit of time here. I mean, we honestly, we could spend the whole podcast on this, I feel like, because that <clears throat> I, I actually just recorded an episode of Behind the Space Bar uh, a couple days ago where I, I said, I'm not sure what's more important, quantity or quality, but I do know for sure that quantity leads to quality. So um, before we before we started talking, you were talking about, you know, the, the crazy schedule of your life and making time for music and making time for your podcast. Um, and tutorials and sample packs and all the fun stuff you do related to music. But can you talk a little bit about, okay, showing up is important. How do you practically, how do you practically show up? Is it something related to a schedule? Is it a commitment you've made to yourself? Like how have you practically found time with a busy schedule, with a day job to show up consistently? Well, I do have some free time, you know, teaching. I get home at a reasonable hour. Mm. I also have to get up at an unreasonable hour. <laughs> yeah. So I need to be in bed by a certain time. So yeah. there is this time constraint. Mm. So I've got a limited amount of time. So I know that I have to kind of get to work. I got to start. I if I push it off too long, then the day runs out. Mm. Um, I find those types of restrictions are really helpful. For example, summer vacation, I can waste time for mm. weeks and feel like I still have a lot of time left. Yeah. But when I'm working, I'm a little more like, all right, we better do something now. So I just try to do something every day. Mm. Uh, with music, I try to do something every day, move forward something, even if it's just publishing a podcast or uh, creating a video or just working on a song just to put some time in. And it's not that it has to be a certain number of hours. It's just some amount of time. I, I do the same thing even with like exercise. Hmm. I just have to do something every day. Yeah. And I try to like wrap my identity up in that. And hmm. so like, I'm the kind of person that like doesn't miss a workout, even though yeah. I, I do <clears throat> once in a while, but yeah. having this, like I, I try to do something every day with music gives me this identity. I have to live up to. Hmm. And that's, that's really it. So it's, it's like, it's the amount of times I show up, not how long or even how good yeah. <laughs> the work is just that I'm, I've just believed that if I do it enough times in a row, it eventually adds up. Yeah. That's really good. I mean, that takes me as you're talking, I feel like <clears throat> it's almost like the audiobook version of atomic habits. And just the whole idea of you don't rise to the level of your goals, but you fall to the level of your systems. And yeah. um, <clears throat> everyone listen to this, if you haven't read that book, I mean, James Clear kind of takes all these ideas from other people and, and, and synthesizes them into to one kind of nice tight package, which is great. But I, I love that idea he talks about of like transformation. And it's more about I'm the type of person that, that creates music every day. I'm the type of person that you know, like you said, that doesn't miss a workout as opposed to I'm going to work out every day. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> again, I think that's, I think that's so important because I learned that lesson really early on when I would see people that talk about particularly songwriters or talk about an artist coming out uh, with a record and they would see, <clears throat> they would see 10 to 12 songs on a record. And I think it's easy to look and think, that that artist goes in the studio and they sit down and they write 10 to 12 songs and they record a record and it's amazing. But what you get, what you understand, the more you work with artists, the more you create music, the more you create podcast episodes, the more you do whatever, create sample packs, whatever the music thing is, is that to get to 12, 
it's maybe 120 if you're lucky. If not, it's 1,200, you know, that you're creating to then get to that 12. So it is that like that consistently showing up. And I love, I mean, I am, I am a Seth Godin devotee, everything Seth Godin writes. It's yeah. like, that's my, you know, he's my guru. If I had to pick a guru, it's Seth Godin. And um, just his whole idea of like consistently showing up and doing the work. I mean, that's his whole kind of mantra. The Stephen Pressfield, put your ass in the chair, you know, yeah. just like do the work. Like that's the thing, you know, that's the thing that unlocks the ability to consistently create is just showing up. Those are three people I love, all three of them. Um, that's awesome. Stephen Pressfield always comes up. I've read all of his stuff and I get an email or uh, no, yeah, I get a notification of Seth Godin's blog every day. Yeah, me and, too, uh, yep. And I read uh, Atomic Habits over the summer. That's awesome. And a lot of that really clicked with me. And even what you said about um, you don't rise to like the level of your expectations or your mm -hmm. potential, you fall to the level of your training. That was something my martial arts teacher said. Mm. And he was talking about you know self-defense and fighting. And it was like you're not you don't you think you're going to show up and like have your best day, mm. you know, like whether it's a sport too, like the big game, you're going to be at the best, you're going to fall to the level of your training. So mm. train hard, work hard, put the time in this way that you don't have so far to fall. Yeah, that's really good. Wow. Uh, this is definitely the most, in, you know, deep I've gone at the start of, you know, we're like 10 minutes into the podcast, <laughs> anyway, that and I'm already and again, we could we could really keep diving deep on this. I, I want to pause for a second because I'm not very great at introductions. And so I'm going to give you a, a second to uh, introduce yourself to the podcast. Uh, talk a little bit about what you do. Um, you've got a book out that I want to talk about for sure and tell kind of an interesting story about that. But uh, why don't you introduce yourself, kind of talk a little bit about some of the musical things you do. Then um, I definitely want to dive into some different specific areas for sure. Sure. I relate to that so much from my podcast. I, I host the music production podcast and um, I often do the same thing. <laughs> the, the podcast almost starts before we can hit record. You That's know, right. So you get excited to talk and, and we spent a few minutes talking before we started anyway, but I think we also are very familiar with each other's work, even though yeah. we haven't had a chance to talk like this before. But um, I'm Brian Funk. I'm a musician, producer, educator. I'm also, like Will, an Ableton certified trainer. I teach a class at Berkeley Online. Um, I kind of got into this by sharing my work on my website of creating music and Ableton Live Packs. And again, to speak to consistency, when I released that first pack, it was like 2011. Mm. And I got it shared by Synthtopia.com. Oh, cool. Yep. website i love and i got more attention for that than i ever did for my music so wow. i was like hmm, i'm gonna keep doing this so There's i decided to, to do it every week and i did it consistently hmm. and that was really smart because it kept me working on music and at that time a band had just broken up played in rock bands my whole life and you know with a band you have like rehearsal time and it's on a schedule it has to be really if you ever want to get more than two people together at once yep. So not having that structure could easily have been a problem, but by deciding to work on like creating these sample packs and tutorials and all that stuff kept me going and kept me learning. And through that, I actually learned how to use Ableton Live. I didn't really know what I was doing when I started. I just knew how to use Sampler. <laughs> yeah, I knew how to put a sample in Sampler, really. That was about it. Yeah. But just, I've always kept going. I don't have... You know, like I teach this Berkeley online class, but I don't have the the degree that my students will get when <laughs> they <laughs> go through all the courses. So it was all like kind of self-taught. I took mm. guitar lessons and stuff, but um, yeah, did all that. Started the podcast, which has probably been more valuable to me than any college education mm. I've had. You know, just talking to people that are doing interesting work around music is... Yeah. It's, it's like the best way to learn. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I wrote a book called The Five Minute Music Producer, which is 365 music making activities. And that, again, was like a consistency thing. Like, I just mm. kind of equated it to my day job, which is high school English teacher, 
where I have to come up with a lesson every day for those classes. And a lot mm -hmm. of times it's a writing prompt or something. So I was like, if I could do that here, I could do this with music. I started just coming up with short activities. And again, to speak to consistency, um, mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard if you tell yourself, I need two hours to do music today. I need an hour. I need this big chunk of time. So I felt like if I just show up for five minutes and do something, at least I move the needle forward a little bit. And odds are I get sucked into it anyway. Yeah. For me, getting started is always the hardest part. Even though I love making music, it, maybe I'm like scared of it or something. Mm. But I can do every household chore I, I can think of before I'll start making music That's right. for some reason. Like yeah. the creative act is scary, I guess. And but if I tell myself, just five minutes, just do it for five minutes, I'm like, yeah. okay, that's not too bad. You know, I, it's like a commercial break on TV. So yeah. the that's, idea with the book was to make those short little activities and, you know, get people going. So I, so I started doing them one a day until mm. I had a year's worth. <laughs> how, how long did, uh, did you literally write it over a year's time? Almost. Okay. Um, when I first started coming up with them, I had a lot of ideas off the top of my head, so I probably did like 30. Yeah. And then I was just keeping up, keeping up, because I was sending them out originally as emails. Mm. So I just needed to keep ahead of the emails. And every once in a while, the emails would catch up to me and I have to bang a few out. Yeah. But I wound up, it was probably about 10 months total from when I started. Okay. But again, it, I didn't know it was going to be a book when I started it. It was just activities that i was sending out through emails and then after a while i was like hey this would be a cool book yeah that's i love that idea of this is going to sound this is like the weirdest tie-in ever but i as soon as you said that it, it took me back to this is something that stuck with me and you don't have to be a religious person to like catch on to this idea but i remember a boss years and years ago uh, i was on staff at a church and he said his goal every day is to read one one sentence in his bible and if you come from a religious background or whatever, listening to this, the idea of like a quiet time or devotion or, uh, you know, Ryan Holiday has like his devotion for Stoics kind of thing. But like this idea of waking up every day and reading something that starts your day off right. And, and a lot of folks in any sort of faith community, we all deal with the same struggle of like consistently doing something. But it always mm -hmm. stuck with me that he said, and this kind of ties us back to that James Clear thing where we started where he just said, my goal is I just open my Bible and I read one sentence a day. And I was like, well, that's kind of like weird. And like, your faith can't be like stronger than that. But I realized it's back to that rising, you know, not rising to the level of your goals, but falling to the level of your systems where at least you read one sentence. At least you did five mm -hmm. minutes of producing, doing something in music or even setting a simple goal is like, Every single day, I'm going to open Ableton Live, or every single day, I'm going to record a voice memo of a melodic idea. It's not every single day I'm going to write a top 20 song. It's just I'm going to do something that moves the needle, that does the work, that again, like you said, it's like going back to where we started is consistently just showing up, which I think that's genius. That's a great, great idea. Yeah, because you're probably not going to read one sentence, right? Yeah. You're going to sit there. But if it's one of those days where you just feel like you can't do it, you mm. can get a sentence in and feel like the day wasn't a loss. That's right. You didn't fall behind. You, you did something. Yeah, that's right. That's really good. I, I want to I talk more about the book in a second. Um, and, and again, I'm not great at podcasting, so I always like break the train of thought to like jump around in the, in the <laughs> schedule here. But um, you said something as you were talking about the importance of you doing the podcast, doing music production podcasts. And I pulled up, I had a stat here that I just wanted to share to like brag on this. Uh, has over a million downloads total, currently receives uh, thir over 30,000 downloads per month. So, uh, and at least I know when I look on Apple Podcasts, it's like very, very highly rated in, I don't know if it's a music category or whatever. Like it's it's up there with podcasts that, that people are downloading and listening to very, very regularly. How... Um, and again, you kind of casually mentioned this. How important is it for artists? And, and let's expand the artist thing to a guitar player, someone who's a songwriter, someone that's a producer, someone that's um, a drummer, someone that wants to be a playback tech and use Ableton Live on stage, whatever it is. How important is it for them to share their work publicly when it comes to getting recognition, getting jobs, 
you know, what, like you, you mentioned about the importance of doing the podcast for you. In your mind, how important it is for people that are doing a skill to share their progress, even if they're just starting, even if they feel like they're not great at it, to share their progress as they're working? It's, it's great. I mean, why not? You know, um, when I started my Ableton live packs, I really didn't know how to use Ableton live. Hmm. I knew how to use sampler and I thought (laughs) the instrument I made, and and I didn't really know how to use sampler. I've learned that I can drop a sample in there and it would make a sound that I can play. Yeah. So I thought the sound I made sounded cool. So I just started a website because I wanted to write about music as a way to document it, but also to share because a lot of the learning I had done was through other musicians sharing their work. And I also realized that I started listening to a lot of their music. Hmm. Some of the people I was following, I was now listening to their music. So I was like, this is cool. It it will scratch a bunch of itches for me. It's also a nice way to not feel like you're shamelessly trying to self-promote all the time because you're sharing the process. But there's always a person who's one step behind you. Yeah. And there's always people that are one step ahead of you and many more as well. So if you even know how to do anything, you could be a value to somebody that's just starting. And sometimes that beginner way of looking at things is really much better for somebody that's new than somebody that's been doing it a long time. You kind of forget what they went through. When my grandmother got a computer in probably the early 2000s, I'm trying to show her how to do email. I'm like, all right, just, uh, just move the arrow there and click on it. And she's like, what? Click? Click. What? Yeah, that's good. Move the arrow. So she didn't know that moving the mouse corresponded with the arrow on the screen. Hmm. She just had, she didn't play video games like I did. So she didn't have any of these background experiences with electronics. It was just completely new. Hmm. And it made me realize, oh yeah, well, okay okay let me so you have these icons represent the thing you want to do and you have to push the button that's click you know just those explanations whereas i'm sure if like say one of her friends had just got a computer she'd be able to go through that with her more naturally yeah and i think that's like so many other things share your work i mean if nothing else i mean odds are in the beginning no one's going to see it anyway yeah and that might make you say well then so what but it also makes you reflect on what you're doing. Mm. And that, that's part of the process we learn. You know, athletes, after the game is over, they watch the footage. Yeah. It's not because they hope they won this time after a bad loss. Maybe if we watch it again, we'll win. You know? It's because they want to see what happened and so they can learn and fix things. And when you're reflecting on what you're doing by documenting it, it can help you grow. Yeah. I, I think it's great. I mean... Why not, really? Um, even just as a personal diary of your experiences, so you can yeah. look back six months from now and say, like, "Wow, I've come pretty far." Yeah, that's re- that's really good because I love the I love the note that as you were talking, I was just thinking of the phrase of like, "Beginning is a gift," and like being a beginner is such a gift that you, it's really frustrating when you're beginning because you just want to get to that end point when you've got it mastered. But it is true that like we forget what we've forgotten <laughs> and. As, as a teacher in particular, like I get better as a teacher when people comment on YouTube videos. And I'm not a teacher in the sense that you're a teacher where I'm like yelling at kids and have to manage a classroom. But teaching <laughs> a concept and taking something that's complex and making it simple, I am, I am served greatly when people comment on a YouTube video. And someone did this somewhat recently and was like, I, I'm thankful for what you did, but you didn't explain, um, you know, I'll, I'll spared the technical details but like but you didn't explain what happens after that and i thought Mm. well of course you know what happens like everyone knows what happens after that but their comment made me realize like no i i do have to think through the lens of someone that's just starting as opposed to assuming that people have the same knowledge that i have that i don't have because i'm a genius i just have because i've done it for a long period of time um Mm. and, and so yeah just that process of beginning i think is super important and um, and I love Seth Godin quoting, uh, I guess Steve Jobs is the first uh, of that, but real art is ship. And just that idea of shipping your work, work consistently, whether people are seeing it or not, is, is, makes you better. And it's just an enjoyable way. And like you said, uh, it's a great way to document the process and to document your progress as you're 
you know, it, it would be amazing for me to see, and I've never seen anyone do this. May, you know, if you know differently, correct me, but it would be amazing to see an artist say, Hey, we're starting to write for the next album and we're going to, we're going to share every single song as we're writing it in real time. You know, copyright, I guess is an issue, but it's like, we're going to write a song and then share the demo of the song as we work towards the album. It would mm -hmm. be amazing to be through that whole process as opposed to just here's the album. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that kind of stuff. I love the, the Beatles, uh, get back documentary mm -hmm. yeah. like eight hours of them doing just that. And, yeah. Um, I love like the demos from artists. Um, it's, it's, that could be a cool way, a cool market mm. marketing tactic for you to get people interested, to just want to see it. Um, yeah, it's, it's why not, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's helpful for everybody. And there's also something about when you're a beginner that, you don't know the rules and you mm. don't know the conventions and you don't know what you're not supposed to do. That's and good. a lot of times you do things in inventive ways. And I get that a lot from my students, whether it's music students or even in high school, because I also have a music production club at the high school that we run and oh, cool. you know, they do things like that you wouldn't think of. Yeah. And you can learn from that. I always feel like I learn the most. Um, it's important as you get better and learn in advance that you remember that you can learn from anybody. Mm. And sometimes you get valuable lessons. When I was a teenager, I was trying to teach my friend to play guitar so I could practice my pentatonic scales over <laughs> you know, yeah. his, his chords. Um, I showed him power chord and he came back the next day and he was doing this thing where he was like pulling on the chords as he played mm. them. So he's bending all of the strings at once, which you don't really hear too often and the places he was putting his hand on the fretboard weren't really in the key. Yeah. And I knew you're not supposed to do that, but it sounded cool. That's cool. So I was like, yeah, even though you don't know what you're doing, like you just taught me something. Yeah. That's great. Hey, I think just that lesson of like being able to learn from anyone and, and is, is super, super big. Um, yeah, man, that's great. Can you can you tell us a bit more about the music production club? Like, how often do you release a sample pack? What's your most recent sample pack, at least, as we're recording this? Uh, and we'll include a link so that people can check that out as well, too. But tell us a little bit more about that. You talked about how you started. Where, where is it now? <laughs> cool, thanks. Um, yeah, the music production club is this subscription service I have where I'm, I'm always releasing new Ableton Live packs or sample packs. So it's basically a way to keep up with what I'm doing hmm. for the lowest possible cost. Um, and there's also, I give a whole bunch of stuff with it. I try to make it like ridiculously valuable, you know, that there's so much stuff you get for, you know, as soon as you join, you you get all this stuff. That's cool. Um, there's also a community. So there's a discord and it's really cool. Like, I don't know how it worked out this way, but the people in there are so positive and helpful oh, cool. and supportive and they're sharing music and they're collaborating. We do challenges from time to time and it really gets like exciting to hear what everyone's doing. And then we do like a, a Zoom meeting every month or so. So usually it's I'm releasing something new every month. Okay. Sometimes a little more frequently. Sometimes if it's a bigger thing, it might be. Sometimes it varies too what it is. But um, that started, I think, in 2015. Okay. As, you know, just seeing how this thing works. And it's been great. Um, and again, what's nice about it is it forces me to do something too. Mm. It's like, I got to make something for them, yeah. you know. Um, and sometimes the things I wind up making are a product of that pressure and they wind up being things I might not have pursued otherwise. And I wind up with things I really like. I mean, that's always my, in making something, I want it, I, I just follow my own desire. Mm. So something that I think would be cool and then I'll make it. Um, the latest thing, uh, my friend brought over an old accordion oh, left cool. it with me. So I sampled the accordion, made a, traditional accordion sounding instrument okay which that one i have for free download um but then there's 
another side of it that's you can buy or you get it with the club where I tried to make more exotic sounds. So mm. that it's called accordion and beyond. And this is the beyond part where that's cool. they're like synth type sounds and percussion sounds and just how far can I take this instrument? Yeah. And, um, that's something that kind of fascinates me to no end with sampling and building instruments is what can I get out of this? How far can we take it? That's really cool. Um, I, I know this is like a music thing, so everyone listening, I apologize, but I want to I want to geek out and talk shop just for a second from a business standpoint, um, because you could say I am Brian Funk, sound designer, LLC, extraordinaire. Uh, go, you know, try to get sound design placements with different companies and blah blah blah. Do all these different things, but. Um, you're you're like pursuing this path of I, I want to create a a, a club a, a opportunity where I can kind of do my own thing just as me as a solo person business as opposed to building a team because I think some people always look on and there's the overused story I'm not even going to get into the story but of like a businessman visiting a fisherman and saying oh if you did this yeah. you could scale your business blah 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 and he's like and he gets to the end of the story to say he's back to where he is right now but. Right. <laughs> um, can we just for a moment, just, you know, and maybe I edit this out of the podcast because it doesn't make sense in a music podcast and I just do this for the sake of me. But um, I personally, as someone who has a solo person business, just love the idea of a solo individual um, following their passion and following their dreams and starting a business that provides some sort of financial incentive to them, you know, on top of like stuff they love doing. Can you talk a bit about the, not business side from a revenue standpoint, but business side from like the decision to, to do it the way you're doing it versus like, hey, Will, you want to make a sample pack and I'll release your sample pack and I'll give you 30% and cutting deals left and right and doing that sort of thing. Like, why, yeah. why, are, you, why are you doing it the way you're doing it and what are the benefits of doing it that way? Well, if it was working for other companies, which I've done things like that, designing some presets and stuff, and that can be a lot of fun, but you're working for them and they have a specific vision. And, and sometimes that's a really great way to do your work because yeah. you know what to do. I like the exploration side of things mm. and finding out what will happen if, and sometimes mm. what will happen if is it will sound terrible. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, I, there's a little bit of a willingness to fail um, mm. without anybody being angry with you. <laughs> so yeah. that's kind of nice. But it is really following my own whims with it mm. where I can do the things I want to do. So that prevents the burnout stuff. And I've experimented with some other aspects. There's a lot of ways where you can make some money doing music these days mm -hmm. i've done product reviews and you know things like that that it was i mean it's kind of cool like companies send you a cool product and you write about it make a video and you keep it and get paid and yeah that's yeah. that's fun but i really found myself that felt like work mm. that felt a lot like work that was a job and and that was the thing i had to do now to get back to the thing i actually want to do mm. Man, and good. it's probably in a lot of ways could be more lucrative to go that route. Um, but I'm, you know, I do have a day job too. So this is, should be part of the consideration that, um, you know, if something fails for me, I don't starve, Yeah. but, um, it, I want to be able to follow that passion. I also want to protect the music part of my life because mm. I'm af I am afraid that some, and it happens to me sometimes where I'm doing, maybe I'm doing too many podcasts or tutorials. I'm working too much on a pack where now I'm working and I'm like, I'm not doing music. I'm just talking about making music on the podcast and I'm not actually making it. Yeah, that's good. And the thing that has been so important in my life for my sanity, for my social life and everything, music suddenly like, is i don't know if tarnished is the right word but it's you know it's been fractional i've talked to people on the podcast about this where 
as soon as they started, you know, making music where they had to like come up with a new song for the new record, they kind of lose the joy of like the person that comes home after work and takes out her ukulele and just plays in the backyard and the sound just disappears and it's gone forever and no one ever hears it. But it's just that nice, relaxing time to chill out. Um, I don't want to ever lose that. Do you, That's important to me. I, I think I know the answer to this based on what you just said, but do you ever foresee a world where you quit your day job and this is what you're doing full-time exclusively? I don't know. I do like my day job a lot. Yeah, It's getting complicated, though. Uh, the world is changing, yeah. and teaching in a classroom is feeling very archaic mm. you know, compared to like kids that have phones that are flashing and you know tiktok has got a new thing every 32 se- it's not even that long it's like four second videos half That's the time right, yeah like it's really hard to keep up with that um so there's like new challenges coming up with it i don't know if those might scare me off ai who knows but yeah. I also think that's kind of interesting and exciting too. I like that there's a puzzle to it yeah. as much as I get stressed out sometimes thinking like, yeah, I just feel like I'm not reaching them. They're not getting anything. What am I doing here? It's like, feels like pointless, but that's like a problem I'm solving. Mm. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that would happen or not. I mean, teaching is, is a good gig and it's stable. You know, that's one thing with music. Um, you know, I've seen it with my stuff. Like sometimes things are doing great and then other times things dip down. And for, I mean, for example, when the pandemic hit, the podcast went down and listens a lot. Hmm. And I think it's because people were not driving as much. They're not going yeah. places. Yeah. But pack sales went up. Interesting. So people were downloading <laughs> more packs. And now it's kind of like gone the other way. So hmm. now they're a little bit lower but it seems like the podcast is picking back up again. Um, so, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. And it could very well be like um, something changes in the industry, some new product or uh, who knows. Yeah. And, and especially when you're kind of like uh, hitching your cart to something else. Like I am making Ableton Live packs. That's predominantly what I do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one thing I like about the podcast is that it's not that, mm. you know, as much as I love Ableton and everything they do, I'm, I'm sure you know, I mean, they're just a great company, Yeah. but it, there is something nice to have like your own independent thing too. Yeah. Oh. Well, I love, as you're I talking, I, I'm just <laughs> thinking like, there's this, there's this, um, kind of, uh, perfect picture that people have in their minds of, they have a day job. And you, you like either have a day job that you just absolutely despise and you're just doing it because you got to pay the bills or you have a day job kind of like what you're describing where you're like, I, lo- I like what I'm doing. I like the people I work with. I get paid well. But then in the back of your mind, you're like, but what if I could just be a musician and just do this and do that? And I love, though, that you you so perfectly painted like, I mean, one, you're you're a, a, a perfect model of someone who. Um, is building a successful career, podcaster, you know, sound designer, uh, you know, teacher, online instructor, uh, all these different things with music that you're doing and doing incredibly successful, but you still have a day job. So it's not like, you know, hopefully people listening to this don't feel like, because the stories we hear is the person who, uh, you know, had a successful career in finance, but she hated it and she quit it to go start a goat yoga farm. And it just blew up and was incredibly hmm. successful. And it's like, that's very, very rare. Um, but you're, you're like that perfect walking example of like, I have a day job that I enjoy, but I also have this other thing that is successful and is doing well. And I, I like that you even said too, that you want to protect that and you want even, you know, music and even your music related job to not get in the way of just the joy of creating music. Like, I I think that's such a great picture to paint for people. Yeah. Like what if I decide I don't want to do some aspect of what I'm doing anymore? Mm. Um, I could, I could stop if, if I needed it, then it'd be a little different. And it would have to take, I guess for me, there'd have to be a big swing. There'd have to be like Mm. some kind of really interesting opportunities open up musically 
and probably at the same time would have to also be a loss of faith in education systems yeah. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I think as far as education goes for me, um, the real value I get out of it honestly isn't like teaching them how to use a semicolon or <laughs> new vocabulary words. It's more, and teaching English lends itself to this. It's the life lessons. Mm. You know, we can read a book and talk about the characters and then talk about life. And those things are more important to me. And I mm. think that's really the valuable takeaway from most books too. Not, you know, who killed Piggy and Lord of the <laughs> Flies. Yeah. But, but like what happens, what's the message of this? What's what happens with society when there's no law and order, there's no rules is, can we function or do we turn into the Lord of the flies? <laughs> like those questions and how they apply to people's lives are also just more interesting to me too. Mm. So it would, it would take like a big shift, but it's, it's an important thing to think about for people because this idea that all you need to do is, I mean, quit my job or really anything is false yeah, because yeah. it you don't need anything like that to happen to start mm. to try it out and make some movements and if it turns out that what you're doing is working and now like your day job's in the way and you you've got something going that would benefit from more time then then maybe make those decisions at that point yeah but don't fool yourself into thinking like if I quit my job st and I start at zero, I'm going to start YouTube and become a YouTuber or whatever. Like that doesn't just happen. Yeah. That's, it's a slow burn. It's a long build. Yeah. And it's it like, doesn't always even get there. That's right. It's like a 10 year overnight success. You know, it's like, yeah. you only see, you only hear the story of the guy who made one YouTube video and it blows up and they're a millionaire and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, that's creating, consistently creating a video, writing a song, writing an a email, blog post like Seth Godin does every single day, year after year, day after day, month after month, year after year, that then gets you to the ability and opportunity to do that. That's, yeah, that's mm -hmm. really, really good. I, um, again, I want to, <clears throat> I want to work our way towards the book here in just a second, but um, you kind of casually glossed over uh, we, we have a trait in common in that we're both able to live certified trainers. So when did you, um, when did you become a certified trainer? Do you remember what year? Yeah. November, 2013, 2013. Okay. I think that's yeah. similar to when I was certified. I can never, uh, I can never remember exactly. I, uh, maybe it was before, maybe it was around that time, but what do you, if you could take me back to there, do you remember, uh, why you pursued certification in the first place? Yeah, because I was luckily, again, Ableton, very cool, supportive company. And really part of the reason I got into using live in the first place was when I was going on YouTube. And this is like back in the day when I first realized you can learn on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you know, awesome. So I was looking up like Logic Pro tutorials. Mm -hmm. How do you compress? How do you sidechain? How do you do... And I would always come across Ableton Live tutorials. Yeah. And I would usually learn enough to apply it to Logic. But after a while, I was like, well, what is this Ableton Live? I remember yeah. I got a version of it when I had Pro Tools, like back in 2005. But I didn't understand what it was. And got into it. Um, so then when I started sharing my racks, um, they were tweeting it. They were oh, sharing cool. it too. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it was like, I hit the big time, you know, awesome. <laughs> like Ableton tweeted this. It was really fun and exciting. So they were like, they kind of knew me. I was in their orbit and I was teaching a little bit. Like I would do like workshops once in a while here in New York. Um, and then I, I sort of started to see these two separate paths in my life, things that I always thought as separate things starting to come together a little bit. Like, wow, I'm music and teacher. I never thought about that. Because music teacher, you think of like, you know, school band, saxophones, yeah. orchestras, yeah. marching band. And I had nothing to do with that my whole life. So that wasn't going to be me. Mm -hmm. But these other things started popping up. And then I was like, yeah, you know, after learning live, pretty rigorously for those like first couple of years I was using it. I was like, you know, let's, what the heck? Let's see about this, mm. you know, and just applied and went through the process. Do you, 
again, I'm taking you way back, but uh, I asked this question to my buddy Jeff Kaler, who, as I'm recording this, his episode will air on Monday. And nice. he was like, man, you're taking me way back. But do you remember, are there any particular highlights from the certification event that stick out in your mind that you look back on either with like sheer terror because they asked you something or like just pure joy of a really fun moment from the certification event. It was a great experience and it was probably the best professional development experience I've had as a teacher. Mm. Like of all the th little meetings and workshops I've been through through my job, wow, that's it huge. was it really was. And, and I haven't ever been in a situation where there's a lot of critique going on, you know, where you're critiquing others, they're critiquing you. People from Ableton are critiquing you, you know, people like, you know, because you've seen, seen them the on like, yeah, like you, <laughs> like, so, um, it, that was a really, that could be a really nerve wracking experience, but they did it in such a way where it just felt so comfortable mm. and it, it was genuinely helpful. They were trying to help. Yeah. Um, and I took a lot away from that. You know, how you can, like how, I've been in art classes where you do critiques and it's scary and mm. this was just done so well. I appreciated that a lot. It was, there were times when they asked questions that I just didn't know the answer to. Or we even had uh, one of the people that was there was kind of uh, playing the role of the difficult audience member at times. Oh, nice. Okay. You know, so like trying to rattle you a little bit. So that was kind of fun. That's, <laughs> it's, it's funny as you're saying that. It, um, it, when I was talking to Jeff, I was reminded <clears throat> of at the event, I had to explain what warping was. And uh, Houston was like, asking questions that he clearly knew what the answer was, but I was like, oh, how do I explain this? But you, you reminded me of such a great moment. That's really similar to what you're talking about of, uh, I was in the middle of explaining something and probably in the kindest, gentlest way possible. Houston like interrupted me and he, again, it's in front of this group of people, which could be a very nerve wracking thing, but he was like, "Will, man, you're a great teacher but sometimes you get so lost in, like you get so psyched on what you're showing us that you forget that you're like supposed to take us somewhere. And so along the way, you're like showing us how you made this pad and you're like super pumped on it. And we all like are joining in in your enthusiasm. But this conversation was about, you know, how to load an instrument rack into Ableton Live and 20 minutes later, <laughs> you're like, so that's how I made a pad. And um, I forgot about that till that very moment you said that because it took me back to him. I mean, that's something I'm still working on, but that took me back to such a like gentle way to accept, you know, feedback in front of a group of people that I was like, yeah, that's huge. Like for him to pinpoint that and to draw it out and do it in a way that doesn't make me like instantly put up my defenses. Mm -hmm. That's that's a skill. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, they really had it down to an art mm -hmm. at ours. Um, and, you know, the other people that I was going through the event with, we bonded, you know, mm -hmm. we're going through this difficult thing together. And it, it wasn't like a competition, like only yeah. the best two get through. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's nothing like that. So it was very communal and everyone was there to help. And that could have really been a situation that was much different with, yeah. with just a few tweaks. It would have been scary, hellish and, <laughs> you know, just awful, but it was really done well. So, yeah. That's, and, and, you know, like good. people might not know, but they're not teaching you how to use Ableton live. That's not the point. It's, it's more of about teaching yeah. and, and that stuff. And, for me as a teacher, you know, I, I felt like I was kind of good at that already, but I learned so much, mm. you know, a lot of things that I took to my regular job. That's really good. I, um, I want to start to wrap up our conversation talking about, again, going back to the book and it's, it's something you very recently as we're recording this have released. Um, I, uh, I, I was really, uh, one impressed with your candor and your humility uh, by an email a couple months ago, maybe I don't even know exactly how long ago it was, um, where you shared an experience with the book that I, I don't want to steal the thunder because I'd love for you to kind of tell some of this story. But um, 
some of us are so afraid of failing that we never start. And then what you realize is that failure, is, you know, I said this, I think, in recording a podcast like a, a day or so ago. So it's still fresh in my mind. But like the, the journey and the path of success is, is basically paved by failures and mistakes. So it's part of the process. Um, but some of us, again, are so afraid of even starting because we're afraid we may potentially fail. But then people that are doing the work and consistently showing up realize you're going to fail. Can you explain, and I'm super excited that you have it there for people watching YouTube to actually see this. Can you explain um, the, the, the book cover fiasco and um, what kind of happened with you when you released uh, your, your brand new book, <laughs> kind of the first edition, if you will? Yeah, this is fun. And, and this is a good <laughs> make lemonade out of lemons story, I guess, too. But, you know, you just make a great point. Like, you have to be willing to fail yeah at, at everything just like if you were a little baby afraid to fail you would never learn how to walk mm. but you keep getting up and keep going you just have to accept that that's going to happen yeah. so yeah here's the book the five minute music producer um i have two copies of it because i'll show you the problem uh so i was it was really cool i got this thing done made it into an ebook. And then I realized on Amazon you can do um, you know hard copy books. So this is great. So I'll, I'll make hard copy versions too. They print them on demand. And I got it printed. I got myself a copy. I was bringing it around. I was showing people, friends of mine, yo, check it out. Like it's it's real. You know, you can hold this thing. And I guess I sent out an email about it or something. Um, and I got a reply from it and then, and it said something like too bad. The typo on the cover negates everything you have to say inside the book. I'm like, what? And I looked and I hope you can, this will focus for you, but I spelt production wrong. <laughs> I mixed up the T and the I funny irony i guess too is i'm really sensitive to this typo because when i started the music production club i had a logo that had the same typo on it for like six months before i noticed <laughs> that's amazing so i'm aware of how to spell production and i'm sensitive to it but then i saw that i was like no way and i was at work when, that, when i got this and i was feeling good i was proud of myself like i did this thing i made the book and suddenly like a gut punch and i look at it, i'm like oh my god and like people have ordered it, people, it's out, it's, I'm plastering it all over the internet, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my God, and I'm an English teacher too, by the way, <laughs> so you're not supposed to make these, I'm telling people to proofread their work all the yeah. time, I just didn't see it, mm -hmm. I just didn't see it, and people I showed it to didn't see it, and I, I just felt so shot down, like this destroys me as an English teacher, as a musician, as any sort of like person that you'd want to read a book from, an author, authority, uh, any expertise is out the window. I just felt like they finally caught you, man. Because <laughs> yeah. so much of what I do, like, I, I wonder, like, how am I talking to this person? How am I, why do you want me on your podcast? Like, what, who am I fooling here? <laughs> you know, how did I get this to happen? Like, someone's gonna like, realize that i'm a phony real soon and that was the day that was the day it all came crashing down i was just really down on myself about it i felt horrible and just like a loser you know yeah <laughs> it wore off you know a after a day or two you know i i was like all right oh well, like what am i gonna do now you know do i just quietly fix it and mm. luckily amazon prints on demand so i don't have a thousand of these sitting in a box somewhere that <laughs> i'm stuck with but do i hide it do i just like alter it and i was like you know what this there's something of value here yeah. so I, I did decide to come clean and i also there's part of me too that i didn't want someone to be like hey idiot i know what you did <laughs> so we sometimes the, the best thing to do is to like confess and admit but I felt there was that lesson in there, too, of how you're going to make mistakes from time to time, you know. And at, it was really cool after I sent out that email. I, I think I did a podcast on it, too. 
um, people were like, no one was like, I knew it. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> I've been waiting for you to fall for so long. Yeah. It, it was, people were supportive and nice. I got a lot of stories from people. Um, even my parents were telling me when they, with their business, they made all these flyers and they sp- for f- they were business in Florida and they spelled Florida wrong. They wrote <laughs> Floridia. That's and, awesome. um, you know, there was so many people that like came out and said nice things, mm. but it was, well, for one, it's like a good ego check, you know, yeah. just, just remember, you know, you, you might be proud that you wrote a book, but you're still a, an idiot like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> and it it was a good chance too to just say like like i i i lived i survived you know and other people have said the same thing so you can always correct course you can yeah. always fix it and um just because that one word is wrong doesn't mean the whole thing is garbage doesn't mean i'm garbage yeah but for that moment i did i felt like it was proof of all of my like deepest fears the mm. The inner critic was right. And yeah, your whole life, you've just been fooling people and you're probably going to get fired from your job now. And everyone finally figured you out. <laughs> I, I love that. I mean, I think all of us deal, whether we admit it or not, we all deal with imposter syndrome and that idea. I mean, you said it exactly well. That's the way I think. Like, I'll, you know, I had a, a I had, I shared today on Instagram. Um, I just was overcome with this incredible feeling of, um, wow, how fortunate and blessed am I, uh, to work with the companies I work with, to have people that like reach out and say, will we talk about our product? And I'm like, uh, did, did, was this the wrong will? Like, did you mean to send this to someone else, you know? (laughs) And I, I, the thing I love about your story is all of us struggle with imposter syndrome. And I even the exact way you said it, there's a day in my mind where someone's going to go, I I discovered, you know, he's not really who he says he is. He's a liar. He's blah, blah, blah. And I love that you, you had that day. And then the next day you woke up and the next day after that you woke up and you woke up and like you lived through that. I almost picture like next to your studio there, you need a sign that says, uh, you know, how many days since last incident. And you just, you know, like write that down. And because again, you could look at that and go, my career's over. Everything's done. But again, that plays into the story of where we started of like, you've just consistently Mm -hmm. showing up. And if you're going to consistently show up, you're going to make mistakes. And if you want to avoid making mistakes, just never start in the first place. But like, that would be terrible. You know, like you gotta, gotta like step on that path and start that journey so that you have the joy of like the joy of creating. That's one way to ensure you'll never fail is to never try. Yeah. Yeah. And it happens from time to time. And, and, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty good problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot worse things that can go down in life. And it's, it's a funny anecdote at this point, mm. you know. But at that moment, yeah, like I remember the way my stomach felt, <laughs> the, the dropping feeling. And yeah. it does feel awful, but I don't know. Maybe what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, um, just keep going just yeah. and, and roll with it you know sometimes yeah. i think it is a good story you know i and I, that was a choice i had to make you know my wife said like well how hard is it to fix and it's like well honestly it's like uploading a few image of files it's not too bad but we get a chance to sort of write the stories we tell ourselves in our life you know we get to kind of narrate narrate what happens to us a little bit and i think it's helpful to choose stories that are beneficial to us and are helpful rather than the ones that harm us we might have froze huh well, Brian, ironically enough, as your uh, mid story, uh, the <laughs> electric company comes out to reset our meter and uh, disrupts this terrible or this this beautiful, uh, elegant telling of how any any problem can be solved, any wrong can be righted. Um, and so uh, I thought, okay, that's kind of ironic that uh, that the power went out mid midstream there. But um, I'd, I'd love to uh, again. I'm thankful that you 
I want to publicly give you props for saying, hey, I made a mistake uh, owning up to it. Because like you said, you could have just, it's print on demand. So like the, the first edition copy is, is very, very valuable right now. If anyone has it out there, <laughs> uh, don't list it on eBay or maybe list it a few years later. But um, you very easily could have fixed it and no one except for that one guy probably would have ever known. But I love that you like stepped into that. And, and in a way that kind of became a story that added to your validity as someone who practices what they preach, which is like, show up every day, you're going to make mistakes, just keep doing it, you know? And hmm. um, I just, I, I again, publicly, I want to say thank you for doing that. Because for all of us that create anything publicly, um, actually, I, I have a question as I'm talking that came to mind that I want to get your take on this. And then we'll, we'll wrap up here because uh, I know you have to go soon. And I'm so thankful for your time. But um, how do you, as someone who creates content publicly, how do you deal with criticism? There's going to be criticism from time to time. So you have to just know it's coming. Yeah. And, and that's so many things in this process. Like when you're making music even, you're going to have the self-critic. There, no matter how much I'm feeling a new idea, I got a new guitar riff or I'm working on a song and it's just like, yes, this is awesome. It's the best thing I ever made. At some point I'm going to think, oh, I don't know. I'm going to lose it. I'm going to, uh, but I can't get my voice to sound right or mm. whatever of the infinite possible problems I could conjure up in my mind. It's going to come up. Yeah. So you have to just accept that, right? So um, when this person told me that I had this error, you know, they said it in this kind of snarky way, like, oh, <laughs> that negates everything. Like I had a part of me that wanted to be like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, and like get aggressive and fight it. Um, but I never do that. Um, I've found that most of the time, if somebody does make some kind of comment, no, half the time you can just let it go. Yeah. Um, but I always try to address it in a kind way, mm. um, in a way of understanding. Um, and it almost always diffuses it. Mm. And I had one email that always sticks out in my head a lot because it had a particularly crude insult that I'd never heard before. That was pretty creative. <laughs> uh, it's probably not appropriate for this podcast. But again, I had that, there's that urge, you know, that ego thing kicks in and macho something happens to you and you're like, yeah, <laughs> you know, you want to send it right back at them. And that's part of the sad thing about negative energy too, is it brings out negative energy in people. Yeah. But I responded with like, you know, I'm really sorry to hear that this is upsetting you so much. I, I never, that was never my intention. I'm trying to help. And if there's anything I can do in a different way that would be better for you next time, I'd be interested to hear because I want to make the best stuff I can make. So I just kindness and, you know, understanding. And I got a reply that was like, Hey, I'm sorry. I was in a bad mood. And, uh, and to be honest, I've been following you a while and I'm just kind of jealous. And like all this stuff, like I didn't think you'd read it. It's, like they don't know me, no, yeah. you know, as much as like even they might follow, like they, they don't really know me. So you can't take it personally. And I've found that either if you respond with kindness and understanding or don't respond, sometimes the people will stick up for you. That's happened yeah. too. Yeah. But just send positivity because just as the negativity coming towards you inspires negativity in you initially, that's kind of like the initial reaction. Um, the positivity seems to do the same thing. It yeah. brings out the positivity. And I've, I don't think I've ever had anyone double down, you know, to come back at me. And this has happened at school as well. Every once in a while you run into a teenager who's having a bad day mm. and they might curse at you or something. And I've found that if I mellow out and just say like, you know, one kid in particular was fighting with his girlfriend. His girlfriend was in my class and they, they were always out in the hallway before class. And this one day they were fighting and he like cursed as he left and he punched the locker. 
I was like, hey, man, what's going on? And F you, you know, and all this. I was like, hey, hey, come, come here. Just relax. Like, it sucks fighting with your girlfriend, mm. you know? And I've done it. Everyone's done it. No one likes it. It's horrible. But hang out here for a second because you're going to have more problems than just your girlfriend right now if you keep yeah. going through the hallway banging on lockers. <laughs> yeah. you know, somebody else is going to see this and get mad and you're going to, you know, it's going to be worse. Mm. And like, he like melted you know right there just like just like she doesn't understand blah 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 you know whatever the issue was and it it cha- that relationship with that kid was mm. so much better after that yeah. whereas if i would have doubled down on it and been like oh yeah you think you can talk to mr funk that way <laughs> i'd have an enemy for life you know yeah. I'd, I'd be seeing you in the hallway and like dirty looks probably or stuff yeah. it's it's the better way to go. Yeah, it's that's... not always easy to take the high ground, but yeah. it, I think that's the best way to approach it. Is either don't give it any attention or offer positivity and kindness. Yeah, that's really good. I love my wife and I are really big fans of Gary Vaynerchuk and Gary V. He like <clears throat> I don't I don't know you know what's in the water up there in Jersey, but he's just like. The past six months, he's just on this roll on just being kind to people, being kind to haters, you know, and just this idea of like, um, and the first time I saw it, he was like in a live stream and someone said something negative and he like zeroed in on it. And I think our tendency is, I've even felt a difference in me of like my tendency used to be to mock people that made bad comments and then like my crowd would kind of sometimes hop on and like comment back to then. I'm like, no, that's not what I intended. And it's hard for me as a guy who's like naturally sarcastic, like sometimes I'll have fun with people and just be like a smart ass kind of back, not, not in a, like a mean way, but just that's who I mm-hmm. am. But, um, I just love that Gary V's just like, man, I'm just going to show love to this person because something is happening in their life that is causing yeah. them to act out that the last thing they need is like you said, I, you said it so well that like the negative energy uh, that you're putting out is going to, you can like sense it and you kind of tense up and you're like, Oh, what's the, what's the vibe? Like, this is really weird. But if you just kind of hit that with kindness and just hit people with like, man, you know, thank you for, thank you for bringing, like you said, that response of thank you for bringing that to my attention. Like, do you have suggestions? And that just melts people, you know, like right away. That's, um, yeah, it's really good, Brian. Really, really good stuff. It's, it's good for your own mental health too, Mm. you know, so you're not, stewing on that poison yeah. you know and and it's a good example to other people too yeah you know? and and plus if you do lash out on that person and if you've got a crowd of people on your side it could turn ugly and you, that's yeah. not what you want either yeah. you don't want you don't want to ruin someone's day and make them more bitter than they already are yeah. and it's it's almost never you i mean how personal could it really mm. be you know yeah. it's there's something else and most of the time you're the straw that broke the camel's back mm. yep. or it's just someone screwing around and they didn't think you'd ever read it and they're just yeah. maybe they're having fun with watch this i'm gonna write this you know yeah. haha and then yeah. so yeah That's it's really gonna good. happen though but you got That's you really got to be prepared for it and just know it's gonna be there and once in a while when it comes usually it's good to take a breath don't fire off the email or the comment right then and there (laughs) try to let better judgment prevail yep that's really good i i've definitely i have learned there's there's times for me to respond and there's times for me to before responding to get up to walk away to walk outside get a breath of fresh air pause for a couple seconds and then come back and most of the time when i do that i go "Eh, it's not worth replying anyway you know and move on or or respond in a much kinder way um Man, I, Brian, I think that's such a great way to kind of wrap up the show um, and, and wrap up the podcast because it's there's this just kind of constant theme of as we've been talking of like showing up and doing the work um, and, and not letting fear, not letting the fear of failure, not letting the fear of criticism get in the way of whether you're writing songs, creating videos, creating sample packs, writing blog posts, whatever it is, like just doing that work daily. I have two questions to end the podcast. One. What's one 
practical tip you can give to people? Let's stick in that theme of showing up. What's one practical tip you can give people that we haven't already discussed that would help them show up consistently to do the work? You can schedule it. You, I mean, that does help. If you put it down on a schedule and treat it like an appointment you have with somebody else, yeah. that helps. And sometimes even make an appointment with somebody else, make a promise with somebody else, like, hey, we're going to do this thing today. And that's a big thing in our music production club, when, yeah. especially when like January rolls around and we do the January thing, trying oh, to make yeah, a song yeah. every day. Yeah. Um, I often see them doing it, and I say, I got to do it too. I, yeah. I can't not you know, I got it, I got it. And uh, yeah. it gets you going. Um, and, and don't demand a lot from yourself. Like mm. I, I, I think forget about quality, just let, let it, uh, it's about showing up. Who yeah. cares how good it comes out? You kind of can't control that. You can't control how much you like what you do. Um, you can't control how much other people especially will like it. Mm. Some days you have it, some days you don't. And just, realize that you got to get some of those days out of the way once in a while yeah Man, but yeah good. keep it keep the commitment small and try to keep it if you can schedule it or just i always i do the five minute thing a lot where i'm really fooling myself I, like i i know that once i get started i get inspired mm. but it's very rare that i get inspired and then start Mm, it, that's inspire good. inspiration comes later usually i find yeah so you have to like start rubbing the sticks together to get the spark yeah the spark doesn't come then you rub the sticks yeah you know that's good. i think i think seth godin i may be butchering this and i may be mixing gurus but i'm pretty sure in, in seth godin's book the practice i think he says inspiration is for amateurs or maybe that's mm. a press field quote or something but yeah that idea of like showing up and doing yeah. the work is the thing it's not waiting yeah it's a very Stephen pressfield way of looking at things yeah that's really sit good. your ass down and go yeah that's that's a, <laughs> and that's hope it. the inspiration the muse shows up yeah the muse finds you when your ass is in the chair yeah that's yeah. good well my second question which is definitely not as deep and philosophical as the first one is uh where can people go to find out more about what you're up to music production club the the podcast uh what's the best place for people to head brianfunk.com it's easy it, not brain funk not brain funk right. that's right you can do it but brianfunk.com well yeah um, i got everything connected there nice perfect brian thanks so much for your time this is uh man Thank this has you, been Will. inspiring to me like i'm ready to go create uh this is like this is the conversation i've wanted to have with 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 someone who's kind of on the same wavelength of the importance of showing up so uh again thanks for being here Thanks for the work you do, the inspiration to all of us to keep creating, to keep going. Um, this has been fun. Thanks, man. It's been a lot of fun for me too. And uh, I look forward to when we reverse the roles here and uh, yes. have you on my show so we can continue this because that's a lot of the stuff I like to get into yeah. too. And it, it's important to surround yourself with people that are positive and yeah. encouraging like yourself. So. I yeah. look forward to the next time we get to chat. Likewise. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Goodness. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that conversation again. Uh, as these always go, I feel like we could talk much, much longer. Uh, as I'm recording this, uh, I'm super excited because next week, a week from today, uh, I'll be recording an episode uh, with Brian for his podcast, and I cannot wait to do that. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes of this episode, either as it comes out or if it's already happened. I don't know how the you know, the, the time continuum works, but we'll figure it out and we'll link it up. But gosh, I had such a great time listening and, and chatting with Brian, and uh, I told him off there, I said, gosh, I, I've been looking forward to this, and I love talking to people that have kind of the similar heart and similar approach of the importance of showing up, the importance of consistency. Uh, and that's something that um, sometimes I do well, but something I really struggle with, but something that I value va highly. And I mentioned this in the show, but um, I'm not sure what's more important, quantity or quality, but I do know that quantity leaves, leads to quality. And uh, so super grateful and thankful uh, to Brian for his time. Hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, do me a favor, check out the links in the description of this podcast. Uh, I would love for you to head over to uh, Brian's Music Production Club and subscribe. Even if you're only subscribed for a month or so, I think you're going to get tons and tons of value out of it. 
uh, because of just kind of who he is as a person, the way he inspires people to create. Honestly, I'm inspired. After our conversation, I'm ready to like go create some patches. I'm ready to write some music. Uh, I'm ready to record some more courses and videos. And so I think you're going to get the same experience if you go sign up for the Music Production Club. And make sure you go and subscribe and follow his podcast. Uh, he has some really, really great producers, great Ableton Live certified trainers. Um, you're, you're definitely going to enjoy it. So again, thanks to Brian for being on the podcast. Thank you for to you for listening. If you listen every single week, gosh, thank you so much. If this is your first time listening, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you back next week. If you're watching on YouTube, you know the drill. Make sure to subscribe and enable the bell icon so you see when episodes like this go live and when you see when tutorials go live. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, uh, do me a favor, follow, subscribe to the show. And if you enjoy it, then leave a rating or review. Uh, and most importantly, no matter where you're watching or listening, if you enjoyed today's episode, share it with someone that you think will also enjoy it. Uh, this was a super fun conversation and I can't wait for my next one. Thanks so much for listening and watching and we'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye.